Shalom and welcome to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. In this session, we are going to be covering the topic of biblical terms which describe the exiles of Israel. And why understanding these terms is so important is because these terms are going to be referenced in the New Testament and in Yeshua's ministry, which we're going to see in this lesson. To begin with, we need to understand that biblical terms which describe the exiles of Israel, among other things, are blind, deaf, lame, poor, and leprous. In the Sanchino, Midrash Rabbah, volume 9, on page 202, it says, Rabbi Simeon, son of Yohai taught, when Israel stood before Mount Sinai and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and obey, Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, at that moment, there were among them neither persons with issue, nor lepers, nor lame, nor blind, nor dumb, or deaf, no lunatics, no imbeciles, no dullards, and no doubters. With reference to that moment, it says, Thou art all fair, my beloved, and that is from the Song of Solomon. After they sinned, not many days passed before, there were among them persons with issue and lepers, lame and blind, dumb and deaf, lunatics and dullards. Then the order was given from Numbers chapter 5 and verse 2, let them put out of the camp every leper and everyone that has an issue. The nation of Israel is also referred to as being poor and afflicted. And the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 3, page 383, it says, When Israel asked God, Who are your people? The reply was, The poor. For it says, For the Lord has comforted his people and has compassion upon the poor. That's Isaiah 49 and verse 13. The nation of Israel is referred to as being not only poor and afflicted, but needy as well. From the Sinchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 2, page 652, it is written, Rabbi Yohanan said, Whenever poor, afflicted, or needy occurs, Scripture refers to the nation of Israel. We can see how the nation of Israel is referred to as being a blind man, as it's stated in the Sinchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 3, page 438, where it says, The blind man is Israel, because it says, We grope for the wall like the blind. Yea, as they that have no eyes do we grope. We stumble at noonday as in the twilight. That is Isaiah in chapter 59 and verse 10. We can see where the nation of Israel is referred to as being deaf and blind from Isaiah in chapter 42, verses 18 and 19, and verse 24, as it is written. Hear ye deaf, and look ye blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and is blind as the Lord's servant? Who gave Jacob for a spoil in Israel to the robbers? That is those who came and took the nation of Israel captive. Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his Torah. We can see how the nation of Israel is referred to as being blind and lame from Jeremiah in chapter 31, verses 7 and 8 which describes the ingathering of the exiles, as it is written. For thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob. Remember, sing is a Hebrew idiom that communicates the ingathering of the exiles. And shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coast of the earth. So he's gathering the exiles of Israel, and here's what it says about them. The blind and the lame, 
the woman with child and her that travails with child. That tells you the gathering is going to take place at the birth pains of the Messiah, or what we refer to as the tribulation period. And a great company shall return thither. In the Midrash Rabbah Numbers 7.3, it is explained that exile is a punishment for having leprosy. That they send out of the camp every leper. You find that just as a mortal king has army chiefs, so God has army chiefs, as it says. Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel. Numbers chapter 1 and verse 2. A mortal king has of exile for those condemned to banishment. And God also has a place of exile for those condemned to banishment. As it says, that they send out of the camp every leper. Numbers chapter 5 and verse 2. Continuing in the Midrash Rabbah, Numbers 7.10, another exposition. Command the children of Israel, Numbers chapter 5 verse 2. The rabbis explain the verse as applying to exile. Command the children of Israel, as if to say, because Israel has transgressed the commandments, they have incurred the penalty of being sent away. That is exile. Hence it is written, and let them send away from the camp. Sending away has the meaning of exile, as you read. Send them out of my sight and let them go forth. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 1. Out of the camp, that is, out of the land of Israel, where the Shekinah has its camp. Continuing on, Midrash Rabbah number 710. And the children of Israel did so and put them out without the camp. Numbers chapter 5 and verse 4. When they sinned, they went into exile. As the Lord spoke unto Moses, so did the children of Israel. What did the Holy One, blessed be he, speak to Moses? That if they would repent while in any of the kingdoms where they might be, the Holy One, blessed be he, would gather them together, as it says, from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. And it will come to pass, when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse, and you shall return and hearken to his voice. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. So did the children of Israel indicate that the children of Israel are destined to do repentance in after days and will be redeemed, as it says. In repentance and rest, you will be saved, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. Moreover, as a leper, one that has an issue and one that is unclean by the dead will never be clean until they go into ritually clean water. So the Holy One, blessed be He, will sprinkle clean water upon them and cleanse them, as it says, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25. We also see that leprosy is healed by the sprinkling of clean water from the Midrash Rabbah, volume 5, pages 200 and 201, where it is written, Moreover, as a leper, one that has an issue and one that is unclean by the dead will never be clean until they go into ritually clean water. So the Holy One, blessed be He, will sprinkle clean water upon them and cleanse them. As it says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25. We can see where the nation of Israel is referred to as being poor and afflicted from Isaiah in chapter 49, in verses 13 and 14, as it is written, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. Once again, sing is an idiom for the redemption of his people, the ingathering of the exiles. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy. The ingathering of the exiles is not only likened to a song, but it's associated with the God of Israel comforting his people, and it's done through an act of mercy. And he's doing this upon his afflicted. The afflicted is Zion. Isaiah 49, verse 14. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. So he's redeeming Zion, and Zion feels like they are in a wilderness. 
They've been forsaken. They're in a spiritually dry place. And that's why the prophecies say that the God of Israel, he will pour water on the dry and the thirsty land. And so Zion is redeemed by the outpouring of his spirit. We also see from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2 and verse 14, where the nation of Israel is referred to as being poor and afflicted, as it is written. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. When he redeems his people, it's not only associated with comfort and mercy, but it's associated with the outpouring of the Spirit and the glory of the Lord being upon his people. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. This tells you when he's got to redeem his people. At the time when gross darkness covers the earth, we refer to this as the tribulation period. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you. Where it says the Lord will arise, it's a way of using human speech to say the God of Israel is going to come out of his sleep. He appears to be sleeping and his people are poor and afflicted. And it seems like he's not taking care of them, although he is. But when it says he will arise, it means he awakens and his redemption is visibly seen upon his people. Isaiah 60, verse 14. The sons also of them that afflicted you shall come bending unto you, and all they that despised you shall bow themselves down at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. We can also see where the nation of Israel is regarded as being poor and afflicted from Zephaniah in chapter 3, verses 12, 14, and 20, as it is written. I will also leave in the midst of you an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. It's the afflicted and poor among the nation of Israel who is referred to as being Zion, who's going to trust in the name of the Lord. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Sing is an idiom for redemption. Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. He's redeeming Zion and he's making them a praise on the earth because we're referring to the Messianic era where Messiah rules and reigns with his people who are recalled Zion. And Israel is the dominant nation of the earth. It's a blessing to all nations. I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, says the Lord. So he's redeeming a poor and afflicted people. In the Torah Anthology to the Book of the Twelve Prophets, Volume 1, page 54, we are told that the God of Israel is betrothed to the nation of Israel or the house of Jacob. God's choice of Israel is likened to a betrothal, as it says again and again, I am the Lord who consecrates you. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 8. It is a full-fledged betrothal. When a woman is consecrated to a particular man by an act of betrothal, she is forbidden to others. Similarly, one may not benefit from something which has been consecrated to the sacred domain or the holy temple. Figuratively speaking, the scripture conveys that God has forbidden us to consort with other deities, as it says in the Torah, and I have set you apart from the peoples, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26. In the art scroll of the twelve prophets, volume 1, in the overview to Hosea, on page 29, it explains how the nation of Israel or the house of Jacob is an adulterous wife. Hosea's book starts with God's command to marry a loose woman. It symbolizes the deteriorating relationship between God and Israel over the years from Sinai to the time of the prophet. The original closeness between them is described allegorically in Sher HaShirim or the Song of Songs. Lyrically, it describes the ecstatic relationship of a loving bride and groom, and our sages compare the revelation at Sinai to a marriage ceremony. But many years of sin had changed that. God's command that Hosea marry a faithless woman and have children by her symbolized the degradation of a union that had become worthless by Hosea's time. Yet in spite of this, God refused to reject his people totally and told Hosea to pray for them. The Talmud, Pesahim 87b. In the Torah Anthology, 
to the Book of the Twelve Prophets, Volume 1, page 60, commenting to the Book of Hosea, we are likewise told that the house of Jacob is an adulterous wife, where it says, she is like a woman beloved by her husband who commits adultery. Yet though she betrays him, his love for her is so great that he refuses to banish her. The children of Israel are God's greatly beloved people, yet they stray after other gods or commit adultery spiritually. In the art scroll, Sher Hasharim, the Song of Songs, in the introduction on page 67, it also explains that the house of Jacob is an adulterous wife. The prophets frequently liken the relationship between God and Israel to that of a loving husband angered by a straying wife who betrayed him. Solomon composed Shir Hashirim, or the Song of Songs, in the form of that same allegory. It is a passionate dialogue between the husband, God, who still loves his exiled wife, Israel, and a veritable widow of a living husband, 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3, who longs for her husband and seeks to endear himself to him once more as she recalls her youthful love for him and admits her guilt. God, too, is afflicted by her afflictions, Isaiah 63, verse 9, and he recalls the kindness of her youth, her beauty, and her skillful deeds for which he loved her. He proclaimed that he has not afflicted her capriciously, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33, nor is she cast away permanently, for she is still his wife, and he her husband, and he will yet return to her. So one of the terms of the exiles of Israel, she is regarded as being an adulterous wife. We can see this from Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, verses 28 and 29 as it is written. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. You have played the whore also with the Assyrians, because you were insatiable. Yea, you have played the harlot with them, and you could not be satisfied. You have moreover multiplied your fornication in the land of Canaan and under Chaldea, which is Babylon, and yet you could not be satisfied. Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 30, 32, 35, and 38, it goes on to say, How weak is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the work of an imperish, whorish woman. But as a wife that commits adultery, which takes strangers instead of her husband, wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. I will judge you as a woman that breaks wedlock. Israel is regarded as being nida while in exile, which means forbidden from her husband. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 7, page 109, it is written, Jerusalem has grievously sinned. Do the heathen nations then not sin? But although they sin, it has no sequel in punishment. Israel, however, sinned and were punished. Therefore, she has become as one unclean, la nida. She was doomed to vega bondage. Nida, or unclean, is connected in the Hebrew language to nada, which means a wanderer. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 17, we see that the nation of Israel in exile is regarded as being in nida. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we see that the exiles of Israel are likened unto being dead and dead bones. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 3, it is written, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 4 and 5 and verse 11, it says, Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word 
of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost, and we are cut off from our parts. So, a term which describes the condition of the exiles of Israel is likened unto being dead or dry bones. And the art scroll of Genesis, in the introduction on page 42, we are told that the God of Israel, or Yahweh, he not only afflicts or causes his people to go into exile, but he heals as well. He redeems them from exile. Yahweh is associated with the attribute of mercy. And the attribute of mercy is associated with redeeming his people. Elohim is associated with the attribute of judgment, which is connected with him exiling his people. So Yahweh afflicts through the name of Elohim, and he heals through the name of Yahweh. The exile is regarded as a wound. Deuteronomy in chapter 32, verses 15 and 16, verse 26 and verse 39, it is written, But Jeserun waxed fat, then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Who's the rock of his salvation? It's Yeshua. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. And I said... I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound, that is exile, and I heal, that is redemption. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. We can also see how the exile was regarded as a wound from Lamentations chapter 2, verse 13. And then Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 12 and 13. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. In Lamentations chapter 2, verse 13, it is written, What thing shall I take to witness for you? What thing shall I liken to you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I equal to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your breach is great like the sea, and who can heal you? So the healing is regarded as redemption. For thus says the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 12 and 13, Your bruise is incurable, and your wound is grievous. There is none to please your cause that you may bound up. There are no healing medicines. In other words, no one in the world can solve your problem. Hosea chapter 5, verse 13, When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound... Then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob. Yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound? No. The only one that can cure him of their wound is Yeshua the Messiah. So the ingathering of the exiles or the messianic redemption is the healing of the wound of exile. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 20, 22 And then Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17, it is written, Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto you, for you are the Lord our God. For I will restore health to you, and I will heal you of your wound. When does the ingathering of the exiles take place? When does he heal the wound of his people? Because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, which no man seeks after. When Zion is regarded as an outcast in the world, in other words, the world doesn't want anything to do with Zion, wants to distance itself from Zion, that's when he's got to heal his people of their womb. Do you realize that that hour in history is now? The healing of the wound takes place in the third day. And this third day is a reference from the coming of Yeshua who came after the fourth day. So this third day is after four days, which means it's the seventh day, which means it's the Messianic era. The Messianic era has an evening and a morning, and the ingathering takes place in the evening part, meaning the tribulation of the day of the Lord, which is the seventh day. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Come and let us return unto the Lord, 
He has torn, he will heal us. He has smitten, he will bind us up. After two days, he revives us. When are we going to see his people returning to Torah? After two days. Guess what? We're two days from his first coming. That's why there is a corporate movement within the body of Messiah to return to Torah, because that's what the prophecy says. But in the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. So as we transition from the end of two days and begin the third day is when he raises us up. And then we live in his sight. What's living in his sight? We're ruling and reigning with him during the Messianic era because out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3. Another description of the nation of Israel in their exile is they're regarded as being sold by the God of Israel into the nations. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 26 and 30 it is written, I said, I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? We can also see how the nation of Israel, in describing their exile, they have a status of being sold by the God of Israel to the nations, which means if he sells them, he can buy them back. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1, and Isaiah 52, verse 3, it is written, For thus says the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. For thus says the Lord, You have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Notice you're redeemed without money money. Another term that describes the exiles of Israel is that of being near and far off in their exile. The house of Judah or the southern kingdom is regarded as being near. The northern kingdom or the house of Israel or Ephraim or the house of Joseph is regarded as being far off in their exile. We can see this in two places, 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 46 and Daniel chapter 9 verse 7 where it says, if they sin against you, for there is no man that sins not, and you be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy so that they carry them away captive into the land of their enemy, far or near. Now Daniel chapter 9 verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs unto you, but unto us confusion of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that is the southern kingdom, that is the Jews, and to all Israel, which is now referring to the northern kingdom, that are near and far off through all the countries where you've driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against you. Redemption is a purchase. If the God of Israel sold his people into the nations, he can buy them back. And the redemption is a purchase from the nations. In the commentary to the Torah of the book of Exodus, by Moses Nachmanides or the Ramban, on page 69, he writes, And I will redeem you. The meaning of the word Geula, redemption, is close to the subject of Meker, sale, thus implying that I will buy you from the Egyptians. Redemption without money is by the blood of the covenant or by the blood of Yeshua. Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9, and verse 11, and verse 13, it is written, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. And as for you also, by the blood of the covenants, I have sent forth the prisoners out of the pit, wherein there is no water. Who are the prisoners that are in the pit where there is no water? The exiles of Israel. Has he redeemed them by the blood of the covenant? And who are the exiles? Ephraim and Judah. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 13. When I have bent Judah for me and filled the bow with Ephraim. Let's look at the summary of terms which describe the exiles of Israel. The exiles of Israel are regarded as being deaf, blind, lame, poor, leprous, dry bones, poor, and needy. They are described as being afflicted, sick and wounded, an adulterous wife, an unclean woman, sold in the nations. The northern kingdom is regarded as being far off in their exile, and the southern kingdom is regarded as being near in their exile.
Why is it so important to understand that these are the terms for the exiles of Israel, or at least part of the terms, in their dispersion in the nations? Because these are the terms that's going to be used by the New Testament and by Yeshua and his ministry that will be making a reference to the work of the Messiah to regather the exiles of Israel. Because it is the Messiah and his task to gather the exiles of Israel. In the book by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, I Await His Coming Every Day on page 14, he writes regarding the expectation of the biblical Messiah. This comes from Mishnah Torah, Laws of the Kings, and the Laws Concerning the Coming of the Messiah by Moses Maimonides or the Ramban in chapter 11 of Mishnah Torah, the Laws of the Kings. It says, In future time, the King Messiah will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will rebuild the temple and gather in the remnant of Israel. Whoever does not believe in him or does not await his coming denies not only the statements of the other prophets, but also those of the Torah and of Moshe, our teacher. For the Torah attests to his coming, stating, and this is from Deuteronomy in chapter 30, verses 3 through 5, And the Lord your God will bring back your captivity and have compassion upon you. He will return and gather you from among all the nations. Even if your dispersed ones are in the farthest reaches of heaven, from there will God gather you in and God will bring you to the land. So these verses in Deuteronomy chapter 30 refer to the role of the Messiah to gather the exiles of Israel, and it's the summation of what the prophets write about. These explicit words of the Torah include all that was said on the subject by the prophets. Continuing on, and I await his coming every day on page 18 by Rebbe Menachem Schneerson, quoting from Mishnah Torah, the laws of the kings, the laws concerning the coming of the Messiah, written by Moses Maimonides. He says, if a king will arise from the house of David, and if he does a variety of things, among them being, if he gathers in the dispersed remnant of Israel, he's definitely the Messiah. You know what one of the major objections of Orthodox Judaism, why they claim that Yeshua is not and cannot be the Messiah? He didn't gather the exiles of Israel. And most Christians don't have a mindset that the New Testament or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has anything to do with the Messiah to gather the exiles of Israel. However, the irony to all that is, is this is the central focus of Yeshua's ministry, is to gather the exiles of Israel. It's the reason why he died on the tree. We're going to look at that in a little bit closer detail in a moment. From the book, A Matter of Return, by Rabbi Raphael Eisenberg on page 131, he also explains from Isaiah chapter 11, that it's the role of the Messiah to gather the exiles of Israel. Isaiah foresaw, and in that day it shall be that the root of Jesse, that's Isaiah 11, that stands for a banner of the peoples, to him shall the nation seek, and his resting place shall be glorious. And it will come to pass on that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people that shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamat and from the isles of the sea. And he will set up a banner or an end sign for the nations and shall assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. From this prophecy, we learn that the Messiah... The son of David will gather the dispersed of Israel, the vanished ten tribes, and will ingather Judah from the far corners of the globe. Therefore, it is the Messiah and the task of the Messiah to gather the exiles of Israel. We can see the prophecy of the ingathering of the exiles and how those ingathered are referred to by some of these terms that I've been sharing with you from Isaiah in chapter 35, and in verses 1 and 2 and verse 4 it is written, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly, and rejoice even with joy and singing. Joy and singing? That's redemption. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord. So the redemption is likened to seeing the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Say to them that are a fearful heart. Now, why are people 
being fearful of heart because of the tribulation and the things that are coming upon the earth. Remember, Yeshua says men's heart will fail them for the fear of the things coming on the, on the earth. So say to those who are fearful of heart, he's speaking about the end of days, be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. What's the vengeance? That's the judgment of the nations. Why are the nations being judged? Because they're dividing the land of Israel. Even God with recompense he will come and save you or redeem you. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6 and verse 10. Look who he's redeeming and how they're described. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. That's those who's not following Torah. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Those who won't hear Torah. Those who won't believe and understand that Yeshua is the Messiah. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness... And Zion is referred to as being in the wilderness. Remember, comfort ye, comfort ye my people is a voice crying in the wilderness. For in the wilderness shall waters break out. Waters is referred to understanding of Torah, the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and the knowledge of the Messiah. And streams in the desert. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. With this background, you should now, with this foundation, be able to understand the answer that Yeshua gave to John when he asked of Yeshua, are you the Messiah? Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, it is written, And it came to pass when Yeshua had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed there to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Yeshua, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you he that should come? Are you the Messiah? Or do we look for another? Is someone else the Messiah? And what is the answer that Yeshua's got to give that he's the Messiah? Which should be the same answer that you give that he's the Messiah. Here's his own answer of why he's the Messiah. Yeshua answered and said to him, Go and show John those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Who are the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the dead, and the poor? They are all terms for the nation of Israel in exile. So go tell them the blind receive their sight, I'm going to redeem the exiles of Israel. The lame walk, I'm going to redeem the exiles of Israel. The lepers are cleansed, I'm going to redeem the exiles of Israel. The deaf hear, I'm going to redeem the exiles of Israel. The dead are raised up, I'm going to redeem the exiles of Israel. The poor have the gospel preached to them. That's the role of the Messiah to redeem the exiles of Israel. And then he adds, Blessed is he whoever that's not offended in me. Blessed is he that believes I'm the one that gathers the exiles of Israel. Because you know what? Judah believes that the Messiah gathers the exiles of Israel, but they don't believe it's Yeshua, and they're offended in him. He says, I'm the one that gathers the exiles of Israel, and you're blessed if you're not offended that I'm the Messiah and I'm the one that gathers the exiles of Israel. So you can see from this that Yeshua's answer and his ministry is focused on his role to gather the exiles of Israel. So therefore, what are we going to see him demonstrating in his ministry? That he's the one that does this. He not only says it with words, but he backs it up with actions. But there's a biblical principle. First that which is natural, afterward that which is spiritual. So Yeshua is going to heal the blind, the deaf, the lame, etc. And his ministry, and what he did historically is what? It's a prophecy. Biblical history is prophecy. So these acts that he did 2,000 years ago are prophecies of the end of days, when the actual physical regathering takes place. First, we're going to look at Yeshua healing a blind man. Once again, who's the blind man? It's a picture of him redeeming the exiles of Israel. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 and verse 49. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. You see, he's blind and he's poor. And Yeshua stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying, Look, be of good comfort. You see the code word? The exile and the redemption is an act of the God of Israel showing comfort to his people. Rise. Remember the redemption is associated the Lord will rise. Be of good comfort. Rise. He calls you. Mark chapter 10 verses 51 and 52. Yeshua answered and said to him, 
what do you want me to do to you? The blind man said to him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Yeshua said, go your way, your faith has made you whole. So when they proclaim that he's the Messiah that gathers the exiles of Israel, you're now made whole. And then it says, and immediately he received the sight. Now looks what he did after Yeshua redeemed him. And he followed Yeshua in the way. What's following Yeshua in the way? Following Torah. So the exiles of Israel are to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and follow Torah. Yeshua heals the deaf and the dumb. Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 33. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. You know what Decapolis means? This deck. It means ten. Ten. He came to ten. It's a reference to the ten tribes. Ten cities, ten tribes. It's coded, you see? Remember they asked Yeshua, why do you speak in parables? So that those who know the code will understand, but those who don't know the code won't understand. It's written in code. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment of speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude. Look, from the multitude. The multitude is a code word for the northern kingdom and being scattered in the nations. Because in Genesis 48, what was the blessing that was given? That Ephraim would be a multitude of nations. And he put his finger in his ears and he touched his tongue. Mark chapter 7, verses 34 and 35 and verse 37. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephata, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened. You see, if your ear is open, you know what you're going to do? Follow Torah. Shema means hear. If you're going to Shema, you're going to follow Torah. So when his ears open, it means he's following Torah. And the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. In other words, his doctrine is clear. His doctrine is correct. He's speaking plain. He's not saying, you see, you're, you don't have clear speech when you say, I need to repent of my sin, and after I believe Yeshua is Messiah, I don't need to follow Torah. That's not clear speech. Because repenting of your sin means you're repenting from what sin is, which is transgressing the Torah. And so you can't say, I repent from transgressing the Torah, so that in believing in Yeshua, I don't follow the Torah. That's not clear speech. So you're not really fully redeemed yet. Your tongue still needs healing if this is what you are believing and teaching. Mark chapter 7, verse 37. And many were beyond measure astonished. See, that's a prophecy. When Yeshua gathers the exiles of Israel, many are going to be astonished. Saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. See, these incidents of him doing these healings, most of you have grown up in traditional Christianity. You know of all of these recorded events, but you probably didn't know that this is what it was about. We see in Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 31, that Yeshua is healing the deaf and the dumb and the lame. And Yeshua departed from there and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee. And great multitudes came. Who's the great multitude? It's, it's a prophetic reference to the exiles of Israel, but in his day it's the literal people that were following him. Having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, the condition of the exiles of Israel, and many others, and cast them down at Yeshua's feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. Now here's another code word. They glorified the God of Israel. You see, when he redeems his people, he's setting his glory upon his people. So here's a prophecy that in the redemption of his people, he's being glorified. Remember, in John chapter 12, it says, Father, glorify your name. And he says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now, what is the Hebrew letter that is used to bring glory to something? It is the hay, right? The reference is John chapter 12, verse 28, which says, Father, glorify your name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. What is the Hebrew letter that you put to something that gives something glory? It's the Hebrew letter hay, right? Abram to Abraham, what got added? The letter hay. Sarai to Sarah, what got added? The letter hay. So the letter hay brings glory. To a name. Now, if we have Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, how many Hey's we got? Two. So what does that mean? 
It refers to two glories, two comings. That there was a glory that came from Yeshua's first coming, but you have a yo, hey, a vav, and a hey. What does a vav mean? It means and. So in order for full glory to come, you have to combine the first hey with the second hey, first coming and second coming, for the full glory to be brought to Yahweh. Yeshua heals leprosy, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And when he was come down from the mountain, a great multitude followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, He's regarded as being leprous, the exiles of Israel. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Yeshua put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. In Luke chapter 17, it's recorded where Yeshua heals ten lepers. Why ten lepers? This is a reference to the ten tribes and his ministry to gather the northern kingdom, the tribes of Israel. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 14, it is written, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Afar off is a code word for what? The northern kingdom. Daniel chapter 9, verse 7. In their exile, Daniel 9-7, they're referred to as being far off. So the ten stood afar off. That's a double code word for the northern kingdom. And they lifted up their voices and said, Yeshua, have mercy upon us. You see, the redemption is an act of comfort and mercy. And when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests, which means follow Torah. You want to be healed? Believe that I'm the Messiah, follow Torah. And it came to pass as they went, they were healed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. Now read this Hebraically. Turned back, repented. Shuv. What are you doing? You're following Torah. Turn back. Shuv. Repent. Follow Torah. One of them turned back and look, with a loud voice. How are the exiles gathered? With the sound of the shofar, which is a loud blast. So the one that returns to Torah and is ingathered by the Messiah glorifies God glorifies Yeshua. And he fell down on his face, at his feet, giving him thanks, for he was a Samaritan. Who's the Samaritans? That is the intermarriage between the ten tribes and the Assyrians, their captives. So this is all about the northern kingdom. And Yeshua answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory. So there were ten that got healed. To use Christian terms, there were ten that got saved. There's ten that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But of the ten that believe he's the Messiah, only one in ten followed Torah, and it's by following Torah and believing the Messiah that you give glory to God, that you give glory to Yeshua, except this stranger. So who are the ten lepers who Yeshua healed? They're Samaritans, Luke 17, 16. They're ten lepers, Luke 17, 12. They stood afar off, Luke 17, 12. They were strangers, Luke 17, 18. All terms that describe the northern kingdom. So the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel is the subject of the ten lepers who are healed. Leprosy is healed through repentance. Exodus chapter 4, verse 7 says, And put your hand into your bosom again. It's the Hebrew word shuv, which is the Strong's number 7,725. And he's put his hand into his bosom again, which means shuv. And he plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again, shuv, as his other flesh. And so this is making a reference that the healing of leprosy comes by shuv, repentance. And repentance is following Torah, believing Yeshua is the Messiah. Now, one of the terms for the exiles of Israel is they are nida. So what does Yeshua do in his ministry? He heals a woman with an issue of blood. Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. And a certain woman had an issue of blood 12 years. Why 12 years? The 12 tribes of Israel. And the 12 tribes of Israel have an issue of blood. Their nida, Ezekiel 36, verse 17. And they suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had was nothing better but rather grew worse. That means they're going from country to country and those are their physicians. It's the other nations of the world who they're trying to find comfort in. But there's no comfort. The only comfort is through the redemptive work of Yeshua the Messiah. And when she had heard of Yeshua, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. So what's she touching on his garment? The zitzit. And what is the purpose of the zitzit? Is to remember to keep the commandments. 
So when she touches the hem of his garment, she's reaching out and she's making a proclamation of following Torah. Mark chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. For she said, if I may touch his clothes, that is, the hem of the garment, that is, follow Torah. And if you follow Torah, you believe that Yeshua is Messiah. Because then you say, had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote of me. So when we're talking about following Torah, we're talking about believing that Yeshua is the Messiah. And it says, straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. What is the plague? The plague is the exile because the exile was likened unto a wound. So these are literal events that's prophesying of things to come in its fullness. Because remember, how is prophecy fulfilled Hebraically? Here now, but not yet. In part, but then later in its fullness. The first coming was in part. The second coming is in its fullness. When God told Abraham in Genesis 17 that his descendants would go into the land of Canaan did they, and inherit it, did they go in? Yeah. Did they fully inherit it? No. Not even in the book of Judges did they fully inherit it. The fullness of the inheritance is at the Messianic era. That was only a partial fulfillment of what was to come. Likewise, Yeshua's first coming is a partial fulfillment of what is to come. One of the terms that describes the exiles of Israel is an adulterous woman. So Yeshua in John 4... And also in John in chapter 8, he's got to forgive the sins of an adulterous woman. John chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. He left Judea. That is a prophecy of leaving and focusing on the southern kingdom or Judah. And for the last 2,000 years, while there's been a Jewish believing remnant in every generation as part of God's faithfulness, the primary focus has been gathering Ephraim from the nations. And he departed, went into Galilee, and he must needs go to Samaria. So this is speaking about his focus on the northern kingdom. He's going to Samaria. Then came he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Yeshua, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. John chapter 4, verses 7, 9, and 10, it is written, Then came a woman of Samaria to draw water. She's from Samaria, then what? She's connected to the northern kingdom. Yeshua said unto her, Give me to drink. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's a way of saying Jews don't want to have anything to do with Christians. Uh, you know, they're an idolatry. We don't want anything to do with them, even as the Jews viewed the Samaritans as being an idolatry. Yeshua answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, what is the gift of God? Not only redemption in Yeshua, but he's got to heal you of all your ails. You need to follow Torah, and he's got to gather the exiles. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. John chapter 4, verse 11, verses 13 and 14, it is written, The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From where then have you this living water? Yeshua answered and said, Whoever drinks of physical, literal water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of spiritual water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up, into everlasting life. Continuing on, John chapter 4, verse 15, and John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, it is written, The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. The woman said unto him, I know that when Messiah comes, who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Yeshua said, I that speak to you am he. I'm the Messiah. So he not only proclaims he's the Messiah by healing the, the blind and the deaf and the leper, um, he's telling the, the woman who represents the northern kingdom, he's telling the ten tribes, I'm the Messiah. You need to drink of me. Now in John chapter 8, we are told in an account where we have a woman who is charged with committing adultery, which is the spiritual condition of the exiles of Israel. And... Is Yeshua, is the God of Israel going to condemn the exiles of Israel and say, there's no forgiveness for you? No, he's got to offer forgiveness even as this woman is offered forgiveness. John chapter 8, verse 
3, verse 7, and verse 9. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. You see, the whole nation of Israel is guilty of being in adultery for not keeping the commandments. So you who is not guilty of following the commandments, you charge the case of adultery. But if you charge the case, you're charging yourself. So there was no one to make the charge. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Yeshua was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. John chapter 8, verses 10 to 11. When Yeshua had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Yeshua said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So the reason why we have the incident of the woman at the well who had many husbands, the incident in John chapter 8, because they are pictures of the exiles of Israel and Yeshua offering forgiveness to the exiles of Israel. John chapter 4 specifically addressed the northern kingdom. And here as well, it addresses the exiles of Israel. Redemption is a purchase. And that purchase is by the blood of Yeshua. Acts chapter 20, verse 25 and 28, it is written, And now, behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of of God. So what are you doing if you're preaching the kingdom of God? You're preaching the role of Yeshua to gather the exiles of Israel and that you've departed from Torah and you need to return to Torah. That's preaching the kingdom of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the congregation of God which he has purchased with his own blood. The redemption of the exiles is a purchase. Without money, it's by the blood of Yeshua. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we are told as well that if you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and proclaim Him as your Lord and Savior, He's bought you. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. That's his blood. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. How do you glorify God in your body? You proclaim Yeshua's Messiah and you follow Torah and you walk by the Spirit. Yeshua died to bring together those who are near and far off. You see, Paul knew the code words and he used them in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 and 17 and 18, But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who are sometimes far off, who's that? That's the northern kingdom, are made near by the blood of Messiah. For he is our peace, making peace between northern kingdom and southern kingdom, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Because, you see, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom never really did ever get along. And he came and preached... Shalom to you, which are far off, and those who are near. Those who are far off, northern kingdom. Those who are near, southern kingdom. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. It is Yeshua who gathers the exiles of Israel. John chapter 10, verse 14, Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd. When he says, I am the good shepherd, he's making the claim that he's the Messiah and he gathers the exiles of Israel. Making a reference, an allusion, back to Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 13, where it is stated that Yahweh Elohim, the good shepherd of his people, will gather the exiles of Israel. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. In proclaiming that he is the good shepherd, Yeshua goes on to say that the reason why he's going to die on the tree is for the ultimate purpose of gathering together the exiles of Israel, which isn't fully completed until the second coming. But he dies on the tree at his first coming to pay for the sin of the exiles of Israel and their condition of being blind and lame and lepers and dumb, etc., idolatrous. 
an adulterous wife. And other sheep I have. He's speaking to Jews and he says, other sheep I have, that's Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom, which are not of this fold. He's speaking to Jews. So in other words, he's referring to the southern kingdom. I have the northern kingdom who is not of you, the southern kingdom. Them also I must bring and they will hear my voice. That is the northern kingdom. He's saying that the majority of people from northern kingdom and southern kingdom that believe he's the Messiah will be from the northern kingdom. And there will be one fold, that's the reunification of Ephraim and Judah, and one shepherd, that's Yeshua, ruling and reigning over them. That will happen during the Messianic era. And then Yeshua says, Therefore does my Father love me because I lay down his life. He's laying down his life so that there can ultimately be one fold and one shepherd over them. We are told, likewise, in John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52, that Yeshua died on the tree to gather the exiles of Israel. John chapter 11, verses 49 and 50, And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. This is the principle that the righteous one of the nation of Israel can atone for the sins of the whole community. John chapter 11, verses 51 and 52. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for that nation. And he's speaking specifically here of the southern kingdom or Judah. But not for that nation only. So he's dying not only for Judah, but for another nation. That other nation is the northern kingdom or Ephraim. And that he would gather together in one, that's Ephraim and Judah, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, who are the children of God scattered abroad. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 5, pages 148 and 149, we are told another principle, that Israel is preserved in exile, so that when they get redeemed, they will sanctify and glorify the name of the God of Israel in Yeshua the Messiah. Thus it is written, For my name's sake will I defer my anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee off. Isaiah, in chapter 48, verse 9. The text speaks of Israel. For my name's sake will I defer my anger. My name's sake refers to Israel, with whom the Holy One, blessed be he, particularly connected his name by declaring, I am the Lord your God, Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, and with whose name Israel he combined his own. On this account, the Holy One, blessed be he, deferred his anger with Israel, for he did not banish them from the world and only exacted punishment from them in small degrees in exile in order to cleanse them, not seeking to blot them out so that his name might not suffer profanation through them, be profaned. We find, in fact, that when Israel were in Egypt, they rebelled against the Holy One, blessed be he, and he wished to consume them there, but deferred his anger with them for his name's sake and did not execute his intention. Thus it is written, Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them, etc. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 8. Likewise, when Israel went forth into the wilderness. They rebelled against him, and the Holy One, blessed be he, sought to consume them, but deferred his anger with them for his name's sake, as it says. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them, but I was wrought for my name's sake. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 13. Similarly, the children of the generation of the wilderness rebelled against the Holy One, blessed be he, and he sought to consume them but deferred his anger with them for his name's sake, swearing that he would call them to account during the oppressions of heathen governments. But he did not bring about their complete annihilation, as it says. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand, and I lifted up my hand unto them also in the wilderness. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 21. And for my praise will I refrain from you. Teaches that in order to prevent the profaning of the name of the Holy One, blessed be He, through them He will bring about the final redemption. That's the ingathering of the exiles. The time of whose advent is sealed, as it says, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, for I will take you from among the nations. Ezekiel, and chapter 36, verse 23. 
Israel was created for the purpose of declaring the praise of the Holy One, blessed be He, as it reads, the people which I formed for myself that they might tell of my praise. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 21. It is this that was the cause of them not being cut off while in exile. The summary is he did not cut off his people fully being exiled in the nations because he's got to redeem them to bring glory and sanctification to his name. Yahweh is glorified through his people Israel. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 3. And he said unto me, You are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. Yahweh is glorified through the ingathering of the exiles. From Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 and 2 and verse 10, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad with them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto you, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord. What is the glory of the Lord and seeing the glory of the Lord? It's the ingathering of the exiles. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We can also see that Yahweh is glorified through the ingathering of the exiles from Ezekiel chapter 39. Verses 21, 23, 25, and 27, as it is written. And I will set my glory among the heathen. And what's this linked with? The ingathering of his people. And the heathen will know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. So when he sets his glory among the heathen, he's redeeming his people from captivity. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. He's setting his glory among the nations and he's being sanctified among the nations when he redeems his people. Yeshua returns when the exiles of Israel are gathered, and his return is in the context of he's appearing in his glory. Psalm 102, verse 13 and verse 16. You will arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time has come. When the Lord builds up Zion, that's the ingathering of the exiles, he will appear in his glory. Yeshua prayed for the ingathering of the exiles, and that he would be one with his people, that the world would know that he's the Messiah, and glory would be given to his name and be upon his people in John chapter 17, verse 21 and verse 23, it is written, that they all may be one, that's the unity of his people, as you, Father, and me, and I in you, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, when his people are one, when the exiles are gathered, the world will believe that he's been sent because he's setting his glory among the heathen and he's being sanctified in their midst. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and love them as you have loved me. That the world will know that the God of Israel loves his people even as the Father loves Yeshua. Yeshua in the nation of Israel, because they're one, they get glorified together. When Yeshua gets glorified, that's when his people get glorified. And this is what Yeshua prays in John 17, verse 22. In the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. We are told that there will be fishermen sent to gather the exiles of Israel. So Yeshua does the work, but he commands us to be a part of the work, to be his servants in the work, and he commands us to go tell the good news that he's the Messiah, that he gathers the exiles, and that we're supposed to follow Torah. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that it will no more be said, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from all the lands where he has driven them, and I will bring them again into their own land. How's he got to do this? Behold, I will send for many fishers. 
So therefore, when Yeshua calls his disciples, he's got to give them a job. And the job is to go out and proclaim he's the Messiah, that he gathers the exiles of Israel, and that the exiles need to repent and accept Yeshua and his blood for the forgiveness of their sins and follow Torah. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, it is written, Yeshua, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, referring back to Jeremiah chapter 16. If you follow me, this is your job task. Not only are you supposed to live the life personally, but you're supposed to testify of who I am in my work. I will make you fishers of men. This is our ministry as we can see in Luke chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. When you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. That's the exiles of Israel. When you call a feast, invite the exiles of Israel. And if you do, and teach them about Messiah's role in gather the exiles and they need to follow Torah, if you do, you'll be blessed. For they cannot repay you. Why? Because they're poor, they're maimed, they're lame, they're blind. But you will be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. I pray that this message has been a rich blessing to you. Remember always these words from 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him, he who says he's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, I himself so to walk, even as he walked. And how did Yeshua walk? He followed the Torah of his Father. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Shalom and Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.